Occupational English test. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one. Questions one to twelve. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Um, hello, Gary. I'm Dr. Hamilton. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Dr. Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, you, you, your doctor had called me. I've got your notes from him. Yeah, I've been trying to reach you for the last two year, two months, actually. Right. Um, I've been having a few issues, and I uh, went to my GP, and he asked me to come and see you. Yeah. That's you're, right. You're a very busy man indeed. Indeed, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I've been traveling for a while as well. That's fine. Yeah, so I've, I've gone through your notes. Yeah. And uh, I've seen that you have been troubled for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, clearly for the last five years, um, mm -hmm. I've been having tummy pains a lot. Okay. And uh, the last sort of a month, it's been more and more. Um, I mean, um, long before that, the last six months it's been tough, um, but the worst in the last one month. All right. And uh, I've been trying bits and pieces, but it's not. It doesn't. It hasn't um, like helped me a lot. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, I know that your doctor ha had prescribed some antacids and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, now we have reached a stage where we'll have to run a couple of tests. Yeah, right. More than Has the doctor that. discussed that with you? Uh, he roughly mentioned that I need some blood tests and everything. Yep. And possibly, if things are worse, he said I might need an endoscopy. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yes. So I'm ready for any sort of surprises. Okay. Um, uh, given that, uh, you know, you have this problem, particularly when you have food, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, well, after I eat, uh, okay. to be precise. So. Right. Um, but if I skip a meal or something, I can get it, um, you know, but every time I eat something, mm -hmm. I'm basically acidic, if I take in anything acidic, any fruit juices or anything, mm -hmm. or if I take anything All right. uh, spicy, I get it as well. So. Okay. So can you, can you let me know in detail what you feel and where you feel the pain exactly? Uh, well, I feel it on the lower part of my tummy. Okay. And uh, um, and exactly, it's sort of like uh, how do I put it together? It's a it's a stabbing pain. Like it, I feel like I've swallowed a knife and it's like stabbing inside my tummy. That's exactly how I feel when I have food. Okay. Um, well, if I skip a meal, it's slightly different. I feel like a burning sensation inside my tummy. Mm -hmm. I feel like something's not right and something's on fire. So okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so does that affect your work? Very much, yes. I had to call in um, sick a few times, and uh, when I have sharp pain, I can't concentrate on my work. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, do you take any? Pain medication for that? Uh, well, I do take paracetamol um, every now and then. All right. Um, and I take some ibuprofen, some, like, 
when I have pain. Okay. I have tried some antacids. Um, right. Did that well. help? Well, yes and no. If if it's the burning sensation, it helps. Uh, but if it's more of a stab, if it's more of that stabbing pain, um, I mean, I it, it doesn't help very much. And I, you know, I have to wait for a long time uh, for this pain to settle. All right. Can I know a little bit more about your diet? Uh, what well, do you typically have for say, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Well. Uh, my schedules at work um, changes every week, so I don't have any set times to eat. So my breakfast could be seven in the morning and one week, and probably nine in the morning the next week, and probably the third week I might have to skip my my breakfast. It's all for you know work purposes. Same as lunch, no specific times. Um, in what terms do you generally of, have? Um, in the morning I might probably sometimes. Just have a cup of coffee. That's it. And no okay, breakfast, right. Eric. Um, and at lunchtime, I try to um, grab something from outside. I, you know, mostly takeaway food. Okay. Um, like you know, I've got a Chinese takeaway mm -hmm. uh, right next to my work. I try that. I've got a few burger places. You know, okay. and uh, might try some KFC burgers every now and then. So uh, since I don't get much time to make this food at home, uh, I'd like to know. What your thoughts are of you know what you're going through? Have you got any idea what it could be? Um, I haven't had. I mean, I haven't pinpointed on anything. Okay. Uh, the doctor said I could have um, things like gastritis, or mm -hmm. um, you know, worst case scenario, uh, he said I might have issues with the lining of my. Um, um, it seems very likely to me. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yes. And, uh, However, I can't confirm it at this point of time. I understand that. Uh, yeah. So you'll be having a couple of tests. Yeah. Uh, by next week. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so first we'll go for some blood tests. Okay. All right. Yeah, and so then today or should I uh, come back next week? I on your way out you can give your blood samples. Okay. And uh, I'll schedule an endoscopy for you. Okay. That should be in a few days' time. Okay. And uh, once I get the reports, yeah. uh, I'll see you next week. See, so will you be doing the endoscopy? I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there, yeah. yeah cool. Right, yeah. And uh, do you know what it is? Well, I think it's like showing down a tube down through my that's throat. Right, that's yeah. right, that's right, yeah. It's got a camera at the end. And and... That's absolutely yeah. right, yeah. So you're going through the front end or the rear the, end? The front end, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not um, a great fan of the rear end. Yeah, that's called uh, a colonoscopy. That's exactly. different, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, this is slightly uncomfortable, but uh, you know we will we'll numb you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll spray. Yeah. Something to numb you, so yeah. you know that reduces the discomfort. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's 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 fine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Any questions? Um, not very much. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mr. Alexander, the physical exam's very consistent with some very bad back spasming, causing the pain you're in today. Well, I am in a lot of pain. I've been in a lot of pain for a little over a week now. Yeah. Uh, that's why I went to the emergency yeah. ward, because it just was unbearable. So, yeah. And I'm not sleeping well, neither, from this. Yeah, it's ex you're exhausted. I am, yeah. extremely. Well, this back pain, we can treat with some uh, medication for the pain, some, uh, something for the back spasm as well, uh, exercises, and uh, a heating pad to make you feel better. Uh, most of the time, back pain will get better uh, with this conservative treatment. 
Well, that sounds nice, doctor. I mean, it sounds okay, but what I was thinking is that maybe I should have an MRI done because uh, I think maybe something seriously is going on with my back, so... Tell me about that. Well, I'm concerned that something is uh, seriously wrong, like I may have a pinched nerve or um, a slip disc or something, and I figured an MRI could at least show if that's what's going on or roll it out, and, you know, it'd be sort of like a peace of mind thing for me as well, so... Yeah, yes. Uh, I could see you're worried about it, and I, I would be too. But I have to tell you, uh, the physical exam today shows nothing more than the back spasm. It has none of these red flags we worry about, um, such as the weakness in the leg, uh, problems with the reflexes, or anything with this neurologic exam. It all came back normal today. Um, you had no fever in the history and no uh, problems that, uh, besides the pain that you're having from the lifting that you described. I know you're in a lot of pain um, and you're worried about it, uh, but most of my patients get better with this conservative treatment. Is there something else you're worried about? Uh, well, like I said, you know, it's been a problem for over a week now and I'm really concerned that something is wrong and that I'll never be able to work again or I'll be disabled yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, doctor, look, I, I did some research on my, you know, on my own. I, I went uh -huh. on the internet. I was reading up about, you know, what people do for their back pains and, and I saw this guy, actually I saw a couple people uh, who swear that after an MRI their back feels a lot better. Something to... Uh, to do with the magnetisms, I believe it's in the machines or something, okay. and I hear people using magnets to, you know, to help with back issues and other pains. Okay. So I'm thinking, well, you know, I can find out if something seriously is going on with the MRI, and at the same time maybe feel better because of the magnets that are, you know, going on in the machine. So that's why I'm asking you to uh, give me a referral so I can get an MRI done. Yeah. I know you want to get better. I, I feel that from you. Uh, but the yeah. MRI has not been shown in the past to help alone, the magnetism. Uh, that's not something that it actually does. It's an imaging study. It just shows what's there. Um, you mentioned you wanted an MRI while we were doing the uh, physical, so I pulled out some uh, information for you about it. Because right. uh, the MRI um, can cause some harm. And uh, we don't want to do that. It's unnecessary uh, when you have this type of spasming pain. Um, a study shows that with people who get uh, MRIs within the first month of having back pain are eight times more likely to have surgery. And I don't think you're a candidate or we want you to have surgery at this point. No, I, I don't want surgery at this point. I don't want surgery at any point. Right. I just want my back to get better, and so I figured you know, this MRI could, yeah. you know, show me if, you know, anything's going on and maybe the magnets would help, but you're saying that that's pretty much no, a myth. No, I see back pain a lot. and Most of my patients get better within four to six weeks with this conservative treatment we mentioned with the medication and exercises and heat. What do you feel about that? Well, it doesn't look like you're going to give me an MRI referral, so, um, I mean, I'll try it. But if yeah. it doesn't work or if I have other symptoms going on, Absolute. could we consider an MRI then? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I want you to get better. Sure. And I really think this is going to help you get better. And you will get better. Uh, and if not, I want you to call me. And I want to see you again in a few weeks to make sure you're getting better. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question.
I've got this delightful gentleman for you to look after. You might know him. He had a, a few frequent admissions. Got three words for you. He's mobile. He's independent. And he's alert. Um, he's on. Well, you know, he's got heart failure. Um, he's on a beta blocker. He's got ACE inhibitor, and um, uh, he's anticoagulator as well. Um, but the problem is, like, you have to look after him like an eggshell without cracks. Well, I guess you're okay with that. Uh, he's got bilateral leg dressings. He's got a few social issues as well, but the discharge coordinator will, um, you know, fill you up with that. Uh, rest is all as per the pathway. Um, I might, um, I mean, like, I can take an easy early minute now you've come in. Um, I feel like you're going to America. Oh, God, we're going to miss you so much. Enjoy. Question 26. Now read the question. Mr. Fernandez is a 52-year-old gentleman who was admitted to the ER last night. He lives with his wife, Judy, and was found down at home. They also noted he had lower extremity swelling for five days and was experiencing some shortness of breath and weakness. When they arrived to the emergency room, he was found to be in atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate between the 150s and 160s. After two boluses of diltiazem, he was started on a drip. Uh, he has two peripheral IVs, an 18-gauge in his left hand and an 18-gauge in his left hand. Both were started in the emergency room. Mr. Fernandez is a high fall risk because he fell at home. His bed alarm is on at all times and his call bell is within reach. Mr. Fernandez, since you fell at home, you're considered a high fall risk, so we need to keep the bed alarm on at all times, okay? Okay. And if you need any assist when you get up, you need assistance, so make sure that you call when you're getting out of bed. I will use this red button on this. Okay, so we can count on you guys to call when you need help, right? I need to go get a report on my other patients, so I'll be back in about 20 minutes. But if you need anything, make sure you call, okay? Okay, thank you. Sounds great. You're welcome. Question 27. Now read the question. During your stay, we will work to keep you as comfortable as possible. Unfortunately, it is unrealistic to feel zero pain after surgery. Our goal is to manage your pain at levels allowing you to participate in physical therapy and other activities. We have many tools to attack pain, starting with the peripheral nerve catheter, or PNC, inserted into your operative leg by the anesthesia team. The PNC delivers numbing medication to surround the nerve that supplies feeling to your hip or knee. We supplement the PNC with other medications as needed, either in pill or IV form. One big help in controlling your pain is to keep your new joint active by moving and working with therapy. Lying in bed too long can result in more pain as the joint grows stiff. In addition to pain medication, you will receive a 10-day supply of Lovenox. Question 28. Now read the question. Patient expectation is paramount in the preoperative consultation because sometimes patients come to you with a wrong expectation. Wrong expectation means uh, that the whole postoperative pathway goes wrong. Okay, so this goes into the initial few consultations after we ask them structure the questionnaire about their themselves, their eating habits, their family history, their attempt to lose weight, and their other comorbidities. And then we discuss with them their choices of procedures and what to expect from each from each choice, okay? And these choices will be modified by their ability to, 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 to comply with dietary program and do exercise to help the weight loss.
Question 29. Now read the question. Today I'm going to be talking about a BIAMP overhead paging system along with a Roland Borg nurse call system and the power of connecting those two together. We can automate code blue processes so that when a code blue is pressed, it can automate a response overhead to the paging system, which I'll demonstrate right now. Attention, code blue room. 501 Medical ICU. Okay, now the power of this is that, like it said, Medical ICU right there, we can add any suffix we want onto that and give clear delineation on where the code blue is coming from and where the staff needs to go to respond to that code. I can make it repeat. We can add different preambles, as you heard a preamble before that. It is really a powerful tool, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Question 30. Now read the question. First and foremost, I think 20 is the new 25. When we studied glaucoma in school, most people uh, were under the impression that 25 millimeters of mercury was the high end of normal. We found that recently, 20 mil at 20 millimeters of mercury, the intraocular pressure is elevated enough um, to be adequate, but at 25, it's really starting to affect axoplasmic flow on the optic nerve. So really aim for a pressure of 20 in your veterinary patients. Other things that are new in the realm of glaucoma in pets include um, the realm of neuroprotection, so medications like memantine, timolol, bimatoprost, and minocycline, which may actually protect the nerve and the nerve function. We are starting to look at glaucoma as more of a neurodegenerative disease, so not only an, a disease of the eye, but also a disease of the brain, um, and it can actually be affected by systolic blood pressure as well as intracranial pressure. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
New research from the Perkins Institute at the University of Sydney claims to have found the diet that boosts FGF21 levels. One of the lead scientists on the study was Samantha Solombiat of the Perkins. Welcome to the Health Report. Thank you for having me. So what is this stuff, FGF21? I mean, it's almost eye-crossingly complicated from the look of it. Yeah, it seems complicated, but it's actually not. And Recently, there's actually been an immense amount of interest in fibroblast growth factor 21 or FGF21. And this hormone has actually recently been called this fountain of youth hormone, which we know can be influenced by diet. And the reason why FGF21 is so interesting is because high levels of this miracle hormone, as it's called, has actually been shown to play a huge role in influencing appetite, um, improving metabolic health and immunity, and even extending lifespan in mice. Now, something that sounds so good to be true is usually too good to be true. At this point, there are no adverse effects shown with increased levels of FGF21. In fact, a lot of studies are now being done to investigate FGF21 as a therapeutic target for the treatment of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Let's just double back, uh, Sam. A year or so ago, we had Steve Simpson, who's the director of the Perkins Institute, talking about this 25 diet study where they start, started 25, you started 25 diets in mice to see if you could replicate the life-prolonging effects of a low-calorie diet. We're extremely low-calorie diets in some animal species. In fact, all animal species, it seems, apart from humans, because it's not been proven yet, increases life expectancy or lifespan. Is the FGF21 really the heart of this matter? We think it actually could be. Certainly in this study, we've shown that a diet low in protein and high in carbohydrate is the most effective way to increase levels of this miracle hormone. And that this diet was also associated with several markers of improved metabolic health in mice. So tell us a little bit about this study. Well, what we actually did was performed a really large mouse study, as you said, where we took 858 mice and offered them a range of different diets to see how macronutrients, such as proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, as well as total energy, could interact and influence levels of FGF21. And you found? And we found exactly that, that we could use diet to increase the levels of this FGF21 hormone and that a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet was the most effective way for increasing this miracle hormone. And what effect did that miracle hormone, I hate using that word, that (laughs) phrase, but what effect then did the hormone have on these mice, or were you able to separate the two? We were actually able to show that the exact diet that increased FGF21 also improved things like insulin sensitivity, glucose tolerance, blood pressure, and blood lipids even though the animals were a little bit fatter. And how do you know that was anything to, whatsoever to do with the FGF21, your so-called miracle hormone, and uh, rather than it just being an accident, that it was raised too? What we did was plotted FGF21 using the geometric framework, which is a nutritional modelling platform that helps us tease apart the role of nutrients and calories. And if you line up all the, the surfaces, the response surfaces, in this framework with FGF21 and all the metabolic outcomes, you can clearly see that there's a specific area in the nutrient space that coincides with increased levels of FGF21 and several metabolic benefits. And what kind of carbohydrate and what happened about f- with fats? In this study, fat did not appear to have an effect on FGF21 levels. It seemed to be low protein was the primary driver and that the highest combination was with a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet. So what does FGF21 do to the body? And that's a really good question, and that's really the next step of our study. We want to understand how FGF21 signaling works in response to diet to mediate all these beneficial outcomes. Do we know that there are any medications affected? At this point, no. It, it seems that it, you know, it goes up with starvation, it goes up with overfeeding, There's lots of things that influence it. Did the appetite of these mice change? Do they eat more or less when the FGF21 goes up? Oh, that's a really good question. See, this is one of the things that we were able to reconcile in our studies. As you mentioned, a whole range of literature and previous studies have shown that FGF21 is elevated in many paradoxical conditions such as starvation and obesity, 
high intake of food and low intake of food, as well as in insulin resistance and in insulin sensitivity. So what is going on here? Using the geometric framework, we were actually able to tease apart these findings, showing that uh, reduced protein intake is the primary driver of FGF21. Okay, so what happens in mice does not necessarily happen in humans. Um, how do you know it makes any difference at all in humans? Oh, well, I'm glad you said that. We've actually published work just this year showing that FGF21 levels in humans is also increased by a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet. And of course, this is really exciting because it tells us that the work that we do in mice can be directly translatable to humans. So is there any evidence at all that FGF21 has the same beneficial metabolic effects in humans as it has in mice? Yes, there is definitely evidence to suggest that high FGF21 levels is directly related and associated with several benefits of metabolic health in humans as well. So we should put it in the drinking water then, do we? Yeah, we? probably. That seems to be the case, yes. How would it work? I mean, obviously, a hormone like this is probably destroyed in the stomach. You, this is not something that you would give directly to people, I assume, in the therapeutic context. At the moment, it's difficult to do chronic administration to humans. So what's happening in terms of drug development is trying to develop a mimetics of FGF21 and analogs. So not exactly administering this hormone per se, because it would require chronic injections or chronic administration. So almost nothing that's touted as a breakthrough or a miracle by scientists turns out to be so. What are your modest expectations of FGF21 in humans? Well, in humans, we actually think that FGF21 is extremely promising. We think that, at least in humans, we've shown that FGF21... So a treatment for type 2 diabetes? Absolutely. That sort of thing? Yes. We've shown that humans seem to respond in the same way as mice. So this could mean that we could tailor our diets and our nutritional guidelines to generate a range of benefits from FGF21. Is it too blunderbuss? Is, if you're describing something that sounds blunderbuss rather than targeted. You're just spraying an effect rather than targeting an effect. You know, if you can do anything with it, it's going to be a very wide set of actions which you're going to find hard to control, isn't it? At the moment, everyone is very interested at FGF21, but no one really knows its mechanism of action. And it seems to be a race at the moment. How does it work? What turns it on? What switches it off? And what can we do to find out more about it? So uh, at this point, I think it's um, a really hot topic and everyone's racing to find out the answer. And you hope you'll be first. Hopefully. Sam, thanks for joining us on The Health Report. Thank you so much. Samantha solon is a researcher at the Perkins Institute at the University of Sydney. And on our website, we'll have a link to our previous interview on the Diet and Longevity Study. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Today, I'm going to talk about the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages and their impact on health. I'll tell you about how it leads to increased energy intake and therefore increased weight gain. This weight gain will lead to obesity, and then from that we get all kinds of diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and some cancers as well. Uh, It's quite a big problem in Australia. In fact, Australia is in the top 10 countries per capita for the consumption of soft drink, and it's particularly bad with young Australians. Australian men aged between 12 and 24 are in fact the highest consumers. Another pattern is that it's um, particularly bad in lower socioeconomic groups. Now, as this is such a big problem, there's uh, a few groups, and one group in particular who is trying to fight against the overconsumption of sugar in these sweetened beverages, and this place is called Rethink Sugary Drink. Uh, It's a partnership between 12 health and community organisations, and it includes the Australian Cancer Council, Diabetes Australia, the Heart Foundation, Nutrition Australia, the YMCA, and the Australian Dental Association. Uh, What they're hoping to do is to get Australians to rethink their sugary drink consumption. And they're going to do that by highlighting the amount of sugar in beverages such as soft drink, energy drinks, sports drinks and fruit juice. Uh, If you go to their website, um, which is rethinksugarydrink, or one word, .org.au, you can find some facts about sugar intake in Australia. You can also access various research and media. This includes posters that you can put up. And you can calculate how much sugar there is in certain drinks. And you can also calculate how much exercise you'd need to do to burn off the sugar you've consumed. So what's actually causing people to consume so much uh, sugar-sweetened beverages? Well, there's quite a few things. So there's role models. And this is quite big for children in particular, role models. Now, um, for adults, there's some specific things. And that could be their social setting. So we need to remember that there's a lot of sugar in alcohol as well. And of course, social settings with alcohol, people are going to consume that. Um, We also find that if you're having fast food, then um, lots of people will have sugar-sweetened drinks as well because often they're sold along with the fast food. Um, For children, we're looking at the availability for children. So, for example, how available it is at home, if it's in the fridge, if it's available. And we're also looking at schools as well. Now, a lot of schools have vending machines with soft drinks in them, for example. Um, Another factor is advertising and marketing. Now, a lot of the marketing could be um, targeted for children in particular. So, it could be entertainment or sporting events. There might be lots of... um, advertising for sugar beverages, um, at children's sports events. One example is Moomba in uh, 2015. Uh, this is um, lots of children attend this and there's lots of um, soft drink advertising at Moomba. Uh, if we look at Coca-Cola as one example, so Coca-Cola actually spent $29.6 million in marketing in 2009. So marketing is a really big deal. We also find that price is a big issue as well. So um, soft drinks and juice, they have high price elasticity of demand. What we mean by this is how how much of it's bought will have a big difference on price. Now, it's estimated that if we had to tax 20% on soft drink, then the drop in demand from that tax would reduce to would result I should say in weight loss of between 0.7 and 1.2 kilograms average per person per year just from that tax. So speaking of tax, there's a new tax which was announced in the UK on sugary drinks, and this is going to start in 2018. Uh, now there's already a tax in some places. There's one. There's um, a tax in Hungary, in Mexico, and in France. We've also got Berkeley in California, America, but they're not going to have their tax until 2018, same time as the UK. Um, So with the UK tax, it's going to depend on the content of sugar. So they're measuring it by um, the amount of grams of sugar per 100 milliliters. Um, If the um, beverage has between 5 and 8 grams, then it's going to cost around 30 cents per liter extra with this new tax. Now, the rate's higher if it's over 8 grams, um, and that's going to be 50 cents per litre. Now, it doesn't apply to fruit juice or milk products, so it's just to soft drinks. Um, Now, there's been approval from a lot of health advocates, um, 
However, there have been some arguments that this tax will punish poor people. This tends to be for people who are working for the, um, the soft drink companies, to be honest. They think it's exclusionary. So the argument some people are having is rather than a tax, um, they should be some other methods. Uh, because some people think that um, the tax shouldn't be used to force choices. They think rather than forcing people's choices through price, it's better to increase education and make people have informed choices rather than make the decisions based on price. But we'll see how this tax goes. It seems to be pretty promising for a lot of people involved. So a lot of research has been done on weight gain and consumption of high sugar drinks and the different studies have shown slightly different effects and results. Now one reason for this is that there's been different study methodologies, another is that there's um, different sample characteristics. We also have different definition, I should say, of the variables, so the, the variables are differently defined. Uh, so more research is needed, it needs to be more tightly controlled. Um, but what we do find is that there's at least a probable association between sugar-sweetened drinks and increased weight gain, body mass index, overweight and obesity. Uh, what we've also found is that people consume these drinks without less food to compensate. So what we mean by this is that people are having a lot of these extra calories through their drinks, but they're not actually therefore changing their diet to have less calories elsewhere. So a lot of these drinks are just additional calories on top of their existing diet. So this is um, leading to weight gain. And um, we also find that the weight gain is actually higher than just the excess calories from the drinks themselves. So what we think is happening is that the weight gain isn't just from the drinks itself. Um, it's actually considered that maybe the sugar sweetened drinks um, stimulate hunger or it suppressed satiety as well. Um, and the reason for this is that these high sugar drinks, they're high in fructose. Now, the thing about fructose is it, um, it doesn't lower the hunger hormone ghrelin in the same way as glucose does. Now, glucose is the main carb found in starchy food. So the brain should regulate calorie intake, but with liquid sugar it can't. So what happens is that these calories from these drinks just get added to your regular intake. Uh, once In one study, people added a can of sugary drink to their existing diet and increased their calorie intake by 17%. Now, this 17% was more than just those extra calories from the drink itself. We find that adding um, daily sugar-sweetened beverages to a child's diet, that can increase obesity risk by as much as 60%. There's another a study in America on this, and they found that um, sugar-sweetened beverages can account to 20% of the weight gain between 1977 and 2007. So the World Health Organization and World Cancer Research Fund, they, can sh they consider sugary drink consumption to be a probable risk for weight gain for these reasons. There really are quite a lot of diseases which are linked to the consumption of sugary drinks. Now, one of them is the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, the reason for this is, as we mentioned before, we've got glucose and fructose. Now, with glucose, it can be metabolized by every cell in the body. But fructose, which is what these sugary drinks have, um, well, it can only be metabolized by the liver. And then what can happen if you overdrink them is the liver gets overloaded with fructose and then it turns that into fat. Now, some of this fat gets shipped out in um, blood triglycerides, but others stay in the liver and it just continues to build up until you've got this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.